set last section is honoring the RT patient community partnerships. And we're celebrating the cardiopulmonary health team of healthcare professionals and patients. We're all here together, okay? And our three first three guests are videos uh, from our website that are edited. One of them actually is from last year's meeting. And we'll start with her. Mary Erickson is a pulmonary fibrosis patient uh, in Arizona. And we're gonna hear uh, first from Mary. Tell you what, while we're getting our videos going, uh, I'm gonna start the flip flop, the end of the story, okay? In terms of our patients uh, and our discussion. And um, I, I'm not sure if you noticed one of our slides when we introduced each other uh, in one of the presentations. I was introduced as educator patient. Uh, and I thought I would just, um, don't worry about the slides, I'll just tell you my story real quick, okay? I'm a patient, and the reason I'm a patient is that um, I had an event in, in uh, 2020. Uh, I had a major heart attack uh, on a family vacation in North Carolina. And uh, it was what the cardiac surgeon called 13 days later in Sarasota, Florida. I was in North Carolina. I was very thankful to make it from North Carolina back to Florida, okay? Uh, he said it was a widow maker. I had about 10 or 11 obstructions uh, on, on the cath table there in North Carolina. I looked at the, all of my, my uh, vessel situations and I, all of a sudden it hit me, I am my mom in terms of the, our genetic family history. And I, all of a sudden, I didn't think my mom was a cardiac patient. She was lupus, she was a uh, 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 stroke at the end, uh, but I didn't put the two and two together. Well, what happened was, in my story, was that it was really amazing that I survived from the creek to the cabin, okay? That's where the event happened, going up a mile incline. Uh, and after I survived, uh, my son-in-law, two miracles happened. One, I was able to communicate in the mountains there on a cell phone, lying on the road, uh, to my daughter at the creek. Two, the daughter at the creek was able to reach her husband at the cabin. Okay, I just want to share with you, I'm just so grateful to be here, okay? Number two was a great healthcare team in North Carolina at UNC Hendersonville outside of um, Asheville. And at the time, in June, June 20, uh, June 2020, I did not want to have to have cardiac surgery in Asheville, North Carolina. There was a lot going on in terms of this country, okay? I wanted to get home to Florida and get taken care of. And thankfully, with um, family support, I've been able to maintain a level of health where I passed my stress test uh, that Dr. Robinson was talking about earlier, and I passed that to where I could go home and have the surgery. Situation was that on the way back from North Carolina to Florida, guess what else we had to deal with? We had a tornado that we actually had to drive through to get home to Orlando, which wasn't home. Remember, my home's Cape Coral, Florida for me. But our daughter's there, so we got to her home. Thought I was gonna have my surgery uh, consult uh, three or four days later. Uh, it's a weekend. On Monday, we get the call. What happened was that we had a situation where the insurance wasn't exactly right, okay? So we said, okay, what's now? Fort Myers, Sarasota, Orlando, looks like Orlando's not gonna happen. Thankfully, again, our family of cardiopulmonary, Mark Pellman, my Sarasota boss uh, at Sarasota Memorial, great guy, our former past president, said, Bob, we have a surgeon here that specializes what you need. And I ended up four days later in his office, said I should have not made it. Bottom line is I had the surgery, uh, five grafts, uh, three vessel with uh, the window, uh, the watchtower for the AFib, and basically um, survived. 
At that point, great. Thank you, God. Then I went through cardiac rehab in my home of Cape Coral, Florida, and did fine. And then I'm starting to go back to work with Mark, doing my consulting, helping with lung programs there at Sarasota Memorial, driving up there, chest pain, not chest pain this time, I can't breathe, okay? And it was like a ball in my chest, okay? And it was getting bigger at different times of the day. Some days it'd feel like an orange, some days it'd be like a golf ball, some days it'd be like a softball, okay? So I got checked out at Sarasota Memorial that day. They said, okay, you aren't stintable, okay? However, uh, let's get you on cardiac meds to amp everything up. They amped me up over 90 days from October to January. I went from 30 to 60 to 120 on the medication that I needed. And at that point in time, it was getting worse. So what happened was uh, I had a situation where um, I'm, I'm back home. I've had the surgery and now I'm still short of breath. What is going on? And I don't know if any of you have found this, but in, in our action plan, we talk about you need to be your own captain. And one of the things I found is that I had to fire a cardiologist along the way, okay? And after I find that, fired that cardiologist, I got the right one, but I'm waiting to see the right one, okay? You ever can relate to me? So at that point, I'm waiting to see Dr. A, okay? He's the one, my cardiac buddy in town that really has gone through a lot. I really appreciate my friend's story. I'm, I'm going to see the right doc. Well, the right doc it can't see me in March. to get this the right January. pulmonologist. So what, thank you. So what happens is we have a situation where I couldn't see the right doc or getting in the right doc. Finally got so bad, it went to, the ba to a basketball. I could not take a deep breath uh, uh, without overcoming that pressure, okay? At that point, I had to call the ER. We're in a healthcare system with four hospitals in Southwest Florida at Lehigh. So I went to my local hospital, waited overnight, transferred over to the uh, health park where they do all the major surgery, and waited and got in 14 hours later or something. <laughs> And bottom line is, on Friday, two days later after the event, I'm set for the cath that I think I need. 30 minutes before the cath, okay, the cardiologist says, Bob, we're canceling the cath today. And I, and I said, why, doctor? And he said, uh, I kind of wonder what's going on here. He says, um, we found a large mass right next to your windpipe and other suspicious findings. So we're going to have oncology consult and see what's going on. Now, I need to share with you that what has helped me going all along has been family and faith and friends, okay? And the wisdom and guidance of Tom Berlin, our leader, one of our leaders here in our, our group, who said, Bob, Remember, you're a person, not a number. Be aggressive and optimistic, and make sure you find the team that shares that. So at that point, I was blessed with that situation. I had the confirmation of this metastatic melanoma. It's affecting my lungs, my liver, and my lymph, and the mass on top of it. And I thought, well, Texas, here I come. Moffat, here I come. In Cape Coral, Florida, there was Faith, Faith Lord Gardner, my oncologist, who specializes in melanoma. And I, I think it was three and a half hours that she spent with my wife and I going over options. Do you remember Tom's point about aggressive and optimistic? She said, Bob, you have a couple of op op options here with our testing and everything to confirm, but you can be aggressive and optimistic, aggressive with this approach that might cause more side effects and risk, 
uh, of combined immunotherapy or single monotherapy uh, and be safer, but it might take longer. It didn't take long for Chris and I to decide, let's be aggressive. And I had four months of immunotherapy uh, combined. All the PET scans took care of most of it. I've been monitored over this time. Bottom line is, I'm still short of breath, but I, my cardiac and my uh, oncology reports are looking great. I now can make it. This was my first, my first stress test was this meeting, OK? Uh, and I want to tell you, thank you for allowing me to pass my first stress test, OK? <laughs> Um, and basically, what, what I had to get ruled out, though, I, not, I talked to my primary care doctor, and I said, look, I know it's not the cancer. I know it's not the cardiac at this point. Or the, I can explain it because I love my stealth exercise of swimming, and I don't have problems then. So the cardiologist said, well, it's probably not um, the uh, uh, angina, okay? because I'm, I'm doing fine swimming. I'm still doing this thing. Here's my point. I followed the advice of some great friends who knew a lot about pulmonary fibrosis. And I said, OK, let's rule that out, because I have a history of arthritis, and that's one of the families of pulmonary fibrosis, OK, and of IPF. Bottom line is, I had the test of the H HRCT and the complete pulmonary function test. And by the way, I want to say kudos to all your pulmonary function people. I had a complete pulmonary function test done in 35 minutes so I could make it over to my other appointment. And I, 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 I was, I'm so odd of what used to take so long, and you guys are great. And explain to me the results and everything. Bottom line, though, is that the good news when I met with the pulmonologist is we ruled out the pulmonary fibrosis. So I look at this as the same strategy as I used as a hospital administrator as a manager many years ago uh, when I was trying to get a fourth ventilator when I only had three ventilators in the budget, okay? And I knew there was a foundation fund over here that he could tap into, his, his boss could tap into, okay? And his boss is a strong Irish Catholic at a Catholic hospital. And I said, you know, we're at a point where it's sort of like the Apostle Paul and the thorn in the flesh. And, and that's where we're at with the need of that fourth ventilator. And we got the ventilator. Well, this is how I look at this. This is my thorn in the flesh. No big deal. We can make it. And we're going to breathe strong. And that's my story. <laughs> and now we're going to hear, maybe a little loud, our, 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 our friend, uh, Mary. So I want to thank Dr. Robinson for mentioning that. It, I went through a number of them before anyone could resolve my problem. But I do remember the day that that happened. I was sitting in the pulmonologist's office, and uh, she, she, I asked her what she meant by wearing oxygen. And, and then I just because she told, she told me I was going to wear oxygen 24-7. And I thought, I wonder what that is. And when she, when she told me, I, I lowered my head and I started to tear up a little bit. And then I thought, well, this isn't going to work. So I straightened up and started thinking about how to remanage my life. And um, uh, I've always been an eager student, likes to sit in the front and you know, answer all the questions. And I, I'm a researcher, so I got the I got the work on using those skills uh, and started running sort of experiments with myself, uh, collecting the data that really counts, which is uh, on the end of your finger with a, a pulse oximeter. And for example, I drove to the high country here in Arizona to, to try to reach the same level as uh, flying in a pressurized cabin when I had new equipment to see how it would go. And, and I scared myself a lot. Uh, and I scared the people who were with me because, and, and with time, I began to realize a lot of that fear was probably what was causing me to have that lower oxygen. 
So that was exper- I, I started doing experiments and s- sort of studying myself and learning what, how I could help myself. I'm going to hear from another patient. Her name is Barbara Giffen. She's a COPD alpha patient in Cape Coral, Florida. I've probably had more pulmonary function tests than most people. I'm sure I've had at least 10, and it's probably more. I've had both. I've had the shorter ones. I've had the longer ones. I've had the short ones with the six-minute walk, the longer ones with the six-minute walk. Um, And one thing I can say is with all of the tests that I've had, the technicians are awesome. They go over everything before they start. And then that they don't leave you hanging. Then at each step, they say, okay, now this is the step that this is going to happen. Now, okay, the next one, now this is going to happen. When you goof it up or don't do very well, they'll, they'll very kindly say, well, I think you can do better. Let, let's try that one again. So you may be in there for a while, but I mean, I've, I've never had any technicians be like huffy or put off, like you're wasting my time or anything like that. They're always very nice. They go through everything slowly. They tell you why they're going to do it, what's it, what it's going to do. Um, I know to begin with, they used to give me copies <laughs> of the tests, but then a few years ago, they said, no, we can't do that anymore. So, so some things will show up on your, on your patient portal, um, not the entire thing. They, they used to give me copies of ever, all the graphs and the charts and everything there. Um, now you have to go to the patient portal afterwards and get everything. You know, w- w- once you get to the doctor, um, they, they do go over things, um, but it could probably be a little more helpful if you had a copy at that point so you could kind of go point by point with them because they they know what they're talking about and you don't (laughs) Uh, you know so you kind of sometimes you're in the dark a little bit there um but you know the, the, the the general information they will go over the things with you and a lot of times the technician will too you know if you if you ask well what's what's this doing what's this for um, you know, but as I say, I, I've, I've had a lot, you know, the, 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 the worst thing about being in the box, there's no cushioning on the chair. <laughs> if you're sitting there for an hour, you, your bum is a little sore. <laughs> Other than that, there's really that, you know, there's no discomfort. You know, you may feel, depending on what you're doing, you may feel a little short of breath on this or that, but you know, they give you time to rest. You know, some of the things are, are built in, you know, you'll have the albuterol and then you'll have to wait for usually about five minutes and then they'll repeat things. And that's just to see how you did before the albuterol and, and how much the albuterol improved you, mm-hmm. you know? So I've had somewhere it didn't really improve me too much, but you know, that that's the way it goes. But I mean, they're really, you know, and they're very, they're very helpful just to, you know, let you know how you're doing. I want to let you know, the person on my right was our two o'clock patient that uh, most of you didn't get to hear, okay? I want to introduce him. His name is Lee Lim. And Lee is a COPD patient and paid tribute to David Thompson, the land advent healthcare champion at that talk and share his story about the oxygenarians. But with that brief introduction, we have a few minutes here. I want to open it up for any questions of a long haul COVID patient, a COPD patient, a cardiac patient, anything we can do to help you understand how much we appreciate all you do, but also anything we can clarify to help you in the future. Well, thank you very much, and we appreciate your time today. And as our father of Bree Strong, Nick Jones from the village, as used to say, have a great day!